Welcome to CLTV at Educator Innovator. Today is Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018. I'm your host for, your, for this conversation. I'm Joe Dillon. I'm a teacher consultant with the Denver Writing Project, and I teach here at Rangeview High School in Aurora, Colorado. The group we've convened here is ready to discuss a reading for the marginal syllabus, uh, February's reading. So I want to begin by allowing our guests to introduce themselves. Um, Joe, you're our author this, this month, so would you mind introducing yourself first? Sure, hi everybody, uh, and, and thanks for this opportunity. My name is Joe Kahn. I'm a professor of education at the University of California at Riverside, uh, and I study young people's civic uh, and political development and its relationship to uh, digital media. This is Charlene Dolan. I run a PBL practice in the Chicago area. I also am a PBL coach, uh, pro project-based learning, for those who don't want to use too much jargon here. And I um, offer courses in social studies and in literature and composition. I work with teens, and we have been using Hypothesis, which is a digital annotation tool for some of our work, especially in social studies. Ramey, that leaves you. Hi, hey everybody. I'm Ramey Kalir. I'm an assistant professor of information and learning technologies at the University of Colorado in Denver. And I'm one of the organizers of the Marginal Syllabus Project. It's lovely to be here with everyone today. Marginal Syllabus is a project that convenes and sustains equity conversations in the margins of texts online using the digital annotation tool Hypothesis. We'll provide more details about the project in a bit. But I want to begin by having the author of this month's piece, Joe Collins, a little bit about his background and the writing of the article, which is titled Educating for Democracy in a Partisan Age, Confronting the Challenges of Motivated Reasoning and Misinformation. Well, thanks a ton. And um, I'm really appreciative of this chance to share a bit about this study and the work we're doing and even more excited to hear folks' reactions and thoughts uh, in relation to it. But I'll try to give a quick overview of what, what uh, Ben Boyer, who's my co-author and I, did in this article and, and what we think we learned. Um, and of course, uh, you know, then open it up for, for dialogue. Um, so back in early 2015, uh, as we were working on a broader study of young people's engagement with digital media in relation to politics, we were increasingly aware of the challenge that not just uh, young people, but all of us face, figuring out what's credible, uh, what's accurate. Um, we talked a lot about information and misinformation, and both of those were readily available on the internet. And as educators, what we were curious about is whether or not the media literacy efforts that uh, teachers might engage in had any impact on um, young people's uh, ability to identify what's accurate and what's not, or their desire to identify what's accurate or not. And so we created a little experiment that went on a survey. And the experiment took into account a couple factors. First, it tried to pick a topic that uh, was getting a reasonable amount of political attention, and that was economic inequality. This was following up on the sort of uh, Occupy movement stuff, and, um, and this was before the Sanders campaign made that such a central issue, but it was already an issue. Um, and we also, so we were showing people content related to econ economic inequality, some of which was accurate and some of which was uh, dramatically inaccurate. But we also varied what we showed people uh, in terms of its sort of political leaning. So we showed people uh, some stuff that had a very strong li liberal stance to the argument that there's uh, you know, way too big uh, income and wealth difference in the country. And we showed some people stuff that had a conservative slant that taxes were way too high on the rich and they were already, or the well-off and the, what they might call the most productive members of the society were already paying far more than their fair share. And we were curious whether or not students would identify as accurate 
uh, things that were accurate and whether they would identify as inaccurate things that were inaccurate. And we knew from the research that it mattered a lot whether or not the thing they were being shown aligned with what they believed in terms of policy. In other words, there's lots of research that shows that liberals are far more likely to judge something as accurate if it aligns with their political perspective than they are if it doesn't, and vice versa for conservatives. So the nice thing about an online survey is you can randomly expose people to things. So you can show liberals liberal-leaning stuff and liberals conservative-leaning stuff. You can show them accurate stuff as well as inaccurate stuff, and you can randomize who gets what. So you can tell whether or not uh, there are patterns in the ways in which content gets judged. The other thing uh, that we asked about was whether or not uh, young people had had media literacy learning opportunities that might impact the way in which they judge online content. So we asked whether or not their teachers talked about the importance of uh, judging the factual accuracy of what they find online. And we found, and we asked about whether in their classes they had learned about ways to judge the accuracy of uh, what people find online. And we did that because, again, at a very general level, there's research that shows or that indicates that people need both the will and the capacity in order to do that kind of judgment. That it's possible that many people could know what's accurate, but they lack the will and they therefore decide that's fine, it aligns with what I already believe, I'm good with it. Uh, or there are some times when people are trying to tell what's accurate and they lack the capacity to do so. So both will and capacity matter. So that was the basis of the experiment. And we did it with a nationally representative group of young people from all over the country. Um, and we did all of this, as I said, in 2015, and then it took a while to analyze the data and get ready to publish it, and lo and behold, it gets published maybe two weeks before the election in November of 2016. And, you know, about one week after that, uh, this note, you know, we thought this was an issue before, and really people did talk about this issue before, but the centrality of the issue just exploded with the revelations around how much inaccurate information was circulating and the degree to which there was fake news and all of that discussion. And, uh, you know, so uh, hopefully this piece coming out at a good time is helpful, but uh, clearly um, the enormity of the problem and the significance of the problem was not something that we were anticipating uh, as we were working on it, but it, 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 uh, it certainly ended up aligning with where a lot of public conversation was going. So we did come up with some interesting findings. And I think for educators, they're encouraging findings. What we found was that when teachers talk about these issues, about whether, the, whether judging the accuracy of information is important when they stress that, and when they give kids opportunities uh, to develop skills to judge the accuracy of information, kids are much more likely to label something that is inaccurate as inaccurate, and to label something that's accurate as accurate. And uh, I'll give you the one stat that I think is the most important one. So the big challenge for both liberals and conservatives is seeing something that's inaccurate that aligns with your beliefs. And what we find uh, is in society is when people see something that aligns with their beliefs, they're much more likely to judge it as accurate. And that's certainly what we found in our study. Um, we showed people two graphs that were clearly labeled uh, as uh, coming from uh, reputable sources, and uh, they were very similar graphs. One, was cons one pushed a conservative idea and one pushed a liberal idea, and sure enough, liberals coded the one that aligned with their beliefs as far more accurate than the one that aligned with the conservative beliefs. Even more concerning, though, when liberals liberals saw a statement that was phenomenally inaccurate, they still said it was accurate. So the statement in this case was 90% of the rich don't pay any taxes at all, their tax rate should go up. Um, in actuality, it's less than 1% of, of uh, you know, highest income earners pay zero taxes. 
Um, and similarly, conservatives fared no better on this, on this thing when they saw something that said the 1% pay 90% of all taxes. They, they have taxes should go down. Conservatives said it was accurate, even though, again, it's, the numbers are nowhere close to that. So here's the good news. The good news is that when teachers talked about the importance of judging accuracy and when teachers gave kids skills, to assess accuracy, their judgments of these inaccurate posts improved dramatically. So when someone was exposed to a post that was wildly inaccurate, but aligned with their beliefs, if they had had teachers who did those good practices, the degree to which they judged that post as inaccurate increased by 26%. So they became far more likely to say something's inaccurate when it was, even though it aligned with their beliefs. Um, and we see that as encouraging. There's a ton more to learn about how to do this kind of education well. Our study isn't designed to get into the more intricate and super important aspects of that. So I'm really excited that we have a bunch of other educators who can help us all think about that. But it does show that the work that teachers are doing in schools right now when they emphasize this kind of media literacy is making a meaningful difference. So I'll leave it at that and, and look forward to the conversation. That was a great uh, synopsis of the, of the work. And I think it you know, explains why we're also interested in being a part of this conversation and delighted to have you here, Joe. So thank you for, for sharing that, that piece. So, Ramey, while we're waiting for Molly there, um, would you mind, briefly, before we transition to a conversation about the reading, just to kind of give a little background about this project, some of the partnerships involved, including the author partnership, and, you know, as we're transitioning to the reading of this, maybe you could, you know, set the context for why we're reading this piece socially. This is great. Thanks, Joe, both Joe Dillon for hosting this, and of course, Joe Kahn and, and your co-author Ben for contributing this as partner authors. And so I'll very briefly note that the project that we're gathering around today is called the Marginal Syllabus, and that's a very intentional political and technical double entendre. And so from a political perspective, we want to engage with ideas that might be a little kind of counter or contrary to kind of typical schooling. And so what Joe Kahn just described to us, the importance of information accuracy and notions of bias, that really kind of gets at the kind of importance of having this project from a political perspective. And of course, from a technical perspective, we have online conversations with educators in the public using a web annotation platform called Hypothesis. And so our conversations with partner authors and with other educators occurs in the margins of those texts, hence the marginal syllabus. And this year, we have the, really the, the pleasure of being hosted for the entire year by the National Writing Project, and all of the texts and all of the author partnerships in the marginal syllabus are aligned around the theme, writing our civic futures. And we're looking at notions of civic engagement, civic media, and youth civic participatory politics from a variety of perspectives. And so this study that Joe Kahn and his co-author Ben uh, Boyer have contributed to us is just a real lovely fit with the spirit and the theme of our project. Thanks, Ramey. So that, that sets the context. And what, what I wanna do now is Charlene's joined us as a reader and I myself have read through the piece. And so what we wanna do is just, you know, Certainly, we have Joe here where we can, we can include him in the conversations, and we also want to just talk about our reading of the piece. So, Charlene, I'd love it if you'd share, you know, something you wrote as you were reading or maybe questions that arose for you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I guess I wasn't too shocked by the various biases that we all actually take into our digestion of items that we read in the news. Um, and it raised some of the same concerns I've had for some time about the whole echo chamber effect that if we're on social media, over time it starts streaming us everything that we already agree with. So we lose divergent viewpoints. And I think it's even more compounded with students because um, they've had less, less time to become critical thinkers and readers and so forth. And so having um, methods we can use in the classroom 
that require them to actually analyze and think about things and um, uh, provide substance to whatever their opinions on are helps to um, be better for them to become better citizens of our society. As I was reading, I was one of the things that struck me that I found myself writing in the margins about was, and I think it was about, you know, the research that that preceded this study was just the idea that it didn't seem to matter how much um, knowledge of our political system someone had, or even someone's um, critical thinking skills or their ability to, dem to, to craft arguments. In fact, you know, I, now I can't say that I've done a, a really slow, like I, I did a, a relatively quick read of this, but it seems like some of the things that we would be, we would think were predictors of people's ability to discern what is accurate and inaccurate. I was surprised to see that, you know, those things, knowledge of our political system and maybe even a knowledge of arguments didn't really, you know, set you up for success unless you were really aware of your biases and then motivation was a was an important factor too those things jumped out at me i don't know if i'd uh, be happy to comment on that just to summarize some of the research on this um but this was is one of i think a, a powerful finding that i think um helps explain the frustration many of us feel as we watch political dialogues where we see people who clearly are well-educated and capable of uh, making highly logical and careful arguments, repeatedly doing things that uh, strike us as illogical or factually inaccurate. And part of why they do it is because they're motivated to do it in, in the sense that that's what they wanna believe is true. And part of why they do it is it works because their audience uh, buys it because of this process that, that I think, Joe, you mentioned, which scholars call motivated reasoning. So scholars point out that actually all reasoning is motivated, and it could be motivated by different things. Sometimes it's motivated by a desire to be accurate. So, uh, you know, if you're given a problem often on a school test or test in school, your motivation may be, can I be very careful in the way I do this analysis so that my teacher gives me a decent grade? If you're doing, if you're building an argument in the context of, say, friendly banter with your peers, or you're doing it in the context of a political debate, your motivation is frequently, how can I justify the thing that I want to see happen? And they call that, scholars call that, directional motivation. And what we find is that frequently in the political sphere, the most powerful motivation is directional motivation. It's how do I win the argument? How do I marshal evidence so that I win the argument? Not how do I make the most logically coherent or rational argument? And that logically coherent, well-informed, fact-based argument, people do it when they have what's called accuracy motivation when they're driven by that, which frequently, again, many of us do that in certain contexts, but often not in political contexts. So one question for us is whether or not schools can cultivate commitments to being accurate that move beyond the classroom where your work is being judged for accuracy. And one of the things that I think we find in our study is that when teachers teach lessons that stress the importance of accuracy with respect to digital media, that some of that transfers over into kids' actual lives. And when they're looking at a Facebook, a post you know, that they see in their feed, they're more likely to care whether it's actually accurate or not, and they're more likely to say it's accurate. Um, and I'll just make one more comment that I think, you know, I remember a lot when I was in school and also when I taught social studies in high school. Frequently, the way to get kids excited is to get them debating an issue they're passionate about. There are times when doing that may foster a commitment to directional motivation because the challenge is how do you win the argument? 
And so there've also been interesting studies, not ones we've done, but ones that we report on in the article, where teachers, instead of trying to orient their kids just towards winning an argument, try to orient their kids towards making highly well-reasoned arguments. And that probably has a different impact on the way kids then later behave when they're not in school settings. One of the things my students do every year is a history fair, National History Day. And in that, they're required to develop an, uh, an argument. And uh, it's definitely a very, um, uh, it's a way to develop the habit of having to support their argument with evidence. And they have to find primary and secondary uh, sources that support their argument. And um, in the classroom, one of my favorite questions is why? Why do you believe this? Show me your evidence. And by forcing them, so to speak, um, to ask themselves, yeah, why do I think this? I think it's uh, helping to develop that habit in, in their everyday lives. And if I could ask Charlene, are there ever times when you ask them uh, to identify, say, good arguments for other positions? Yes, I do. Um, I like to use cognitive uh, dissonance sometimes, too. Um, because it just shocks them to hear something that they find unbelievable. Um, but yeah, I'll have them argue two different sides of the same question. And uh, one technique I like is to have them choose the side they want to argue and then assign them to do the other one. And that to me speaks to a very interesting uh, theme, perhaps, both in the content, Joe, of what you and Ben have, have provided for our discussion uh, in February. And of course, the means through which uh, a digital annotation tool like Hypothesis uh, affords the conversation, which is that there's a theme here around perspective taking and how we choose to do that around uh, information that we're presented with, <laughs> the perspectives that we have on what, what we consider to be accurate. Um, and then it sounds as though uh, more proactively, some of the skills that can be cultivated in learning environments to uh, allow for more, perhaps, dare we say, nuanced and, and perhaps leading towards more accurate perspective taking, the kinds of media learn, uh, literacy learning skills that, again, seem to be an implication for this work. And so I think I'm really interested in seeing how, as we move from this conversation in this digital webinar space to, in about a week-ish from now, um, an online annotated conversation which of course invites a public reading through annotation, the perspectives that come into that space. To me, there's just a very interesting bit of almost meta commentary here that's happening. And I just wanted to say, I appreciate that. As Charlene, I hear you and, and Joe go back and forth. I like your point a lot. And I think the thinking about context is super helpful, both in the classroom and as, as you point out, in this online space that you're gonna create. One of the findings uh, in the field in general, is that social context influences motivations, right? So uh, an experiment, again, not one we did, but that others have done, more sort of more psychology-oriented experiment, uh, gives people a editorial. I think it, they use on gun control, and, you know, one's a pro and one's a con. And... Uh, they ask people how strong an argument they think the piece is. And people, as you would expect, think arguments that uh, are identical in their rationality are much stronger if they align with what they believe in, with respect to gun control. So people are willing to say this is a good argument, even if, you know, on the sort of merits as a teacher, we might say this is a really problematic argument. It's not logically coherent. There's no evidence, et cetera, et cetera. The second you say to this person, we want you to rate the quality of the argument, and we'd like you to explain your rating to two other people. You know, we're going to bring you into a room where you can share what you think. All of a sudden, they become much more focused on the rationality embedded in it. And so I think, again, if we create a, say, a classroom culture or the kind of culture that you may create around the marginal syllabus in the annotation space, 
you can create a context in which people won't say illogical things because they feel some level of responsibility to the other humans they're interacting with. And I think that has lessons for us both in the classroom and as a society more generally. And I, I know some folks had raised, I think Charlene, the issue of the echo chamber. Part of the risk of the echo chamber is it puts people in a context where they don't feel the pressure to be careful because everybody just affirms whatever they're saying. And I think part of what we have to think about is how do we interrupt that kind of process uh, so that people do uh, have more of a commitment to being careful and thoughtful in putting forward their beliefs. So I really think that this is given, this is really foregrounded the reading we'll do in February really nicely. We're getting right up against the, our, our, time, our time block here. So I want to just give voice to something. Molly, I really appreciate your perseverance in trying to join us. And, and as we're facilitating a technical project here where we ask folks to sometimes join these, these calls, and more usually we invite everybody to jump in using a, you know, the tool hypothesis, invariably there are technical challenges. And so when technical challenges just arise, I just appreciate the perseverance it takes to sort of you know, be a good sport to agree to join anywho. So Molly's, Molly said her, her biggest annotations were about confirmation bias. And I think what, what this gives me hope, because I've heard, I hear teachers reflect on what students invariably, invariably will do when they have to, when they're charged with reading to develop arguments, they often start with their own opinion and then they go and look for things that will match their own opinion and you know, rush over anything that might counter their opinion. And so that's, an, that's a thing that annoys teachers anyway, but I think this article and the discussion we potentially have in the margins can talk to us about, you know, how do we motivate students differently and how do we think about their motivation? And then how do we think about, you know, how their biases get in the way beyond just, beyond the things that they sometimes do that teachers already know they need to overcome, like reading just to support their opinions. So uh, maybe just a, a little quick, uh, last thought or something you're um, excited to put in the margins when we in fact annotate online if we could just quickly whip around with one last word and we'll uh, we'll end this webinar with that well I'll jump in here uh, you mentioned the biases among students one of the things in the article that I found uh, was like okay well I need to pay attention to this is that as educators our biases also can come through and influence how our students think. And I think it's really important to try to stay very neutral and, because we want, we want citizens that think all kinds of different ways and we want them to come to their conclusions based on their own investigations as opposed to us telling them how it is. I'll briefly share Molly's comment here in our chat as part of my contribution to wrapping up our conversation today. She said, she's excited to hear ideas about disrupting the echo chamber and how we do this perhaps as educators. And that's of course, I think very much in the spirit of the Marginal Syllabus Project. I'll also just again, thank Joe, again, his co-author Ben, for being our partner authors this month with the Marginal Syllabus Project. We're looking forward to a, 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 we hope, a robust conversation throughout the month of February online in the margins. We look forward to seeing folks there. Thank you very much. This was great. Great to hear folks' thoughts. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.